This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, well, a very good evening to all of you here. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening to today's talk, which is entitled Queer Cases, Good Law. And we're very privileged to have with us a barrister who's been working in these issues for over 10 years. S. Chelvin, as a barrister at number five of the Chambers, has a significant reputation in the field. He's profiled in Chambers UK as a doyen in immigration cases involving sexual identity. He represented the case of H.J. Iran in the Court of Appeal and has represented a good number of country guidance cases, not only on issues of sexual identity, but also on a range of other legal points. Um, in between his wide-ranging legal work, including through the pro bono, pro, pro bono panel, um, amazingly, Chelvin finds enough time to do a PhD in law on the very same issues. So we shall shortly be looking forward to Dr. Chelvin. Um, the plan for this evening is that Chelvin will deliver a short paper of something like 50 minutes in length. After that, you'll have the opportunity to put forward questions, observations, and continue the discussion. So without further ado, I hand over to Chelvin. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, I, I should uh, apologize because what we're trying to do in the next 15 minutes is cover the last 50 years of refugee law uh, with respect to LGBTI. Um, or should we say the last 60 years, but there's of course been gaps in relation to queer cases. Um, what are we looking at here is looking at protection, we're looking at safety of individuals who flee their countries of origin because of their sexual or gender identity. We know as a fact that there are 76 countries in the world which have some sort of criminalization of same-sex conduct. We know out of those 76, 42 countries have specific legislation which criminalizes conduct by lesbians. And we know out of those 76 countries, five countries in the world, that's Mauritania, Sudan, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, actually prescribe the death penalty. And we're awaiting to see what happens with southern Sudan, the newest created country of, our, of global village, who are also expected to introduce the, the death penalty. But what we're looking at here is the Refugee Convention. Uh, I'm very grateful, Marguerite, who's, who's manually changing. Sorry, that's one. Yes, thank you. So we're looking at the 1951 Refugee Convention, which was drafted because the countries of the world got together and said the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War shall never happen again. And the basic definition of what, what constitutes a refugee or who is a refugee, we have the definition which allows for five convention reasons including a group called Particular Social Group. But for some historical reason, for some historical wrong, what wasn't protected, the group that wasn't protected within that scheme of Particular Social Group for over 50 years here in the UK were gay men and lesbians. But in those same concentration camps where Jews wore the Star of David, there were also gay men who wore the pink triangle as their badge of difference, their badge of stigma, their badge of shame, and badge of harm. So what we're looking at here is persecution, serious harm, and failure of protection. But what is sexual orientation? In 2007, the academics of the world got, got together in a nice place called Jogjakarta in Indonesia to actually define what sexual orientation actually means. What they describe as sexual orientation is understood to refer to each person's capacity for profound emotional, affectional, and sexual attraction to, and intimate and sexual relations with, individuals of a different gender, or the same gender, or more than one gender. What is important to note there is that we're not just looking at conduct. We're looking at desire. Because when we wake up in the morning and get out of our beds, we open our bedroom door. 
And prior to this definition, there were those judicial decision makers who thought everything was about sex in the bedroom. But what happens is you go out to your bedroom door, you go into your home, and then you open your front door and go into the outside world. And it's this engagement which is with the outside world which causes the engagement with harm and persecution. When we look at gender identity, Joe Carter principles also define Joe um, gender identity in the following way. Gender identity is understood to refer to each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth, including the personal sense of the body, which may involve, if freely chosen, modification of the bodily appearance or function by medical, surgical, or other means, and other expressions of gender, including dress, speech, and mannerisms. Now, it's very easy to start with lesbian and gay claims and add trans and intersex claims at the end. I'm going to start with gender identity claims to show the horror of the way the case was developed. For in the United Kingdom, and it may be un uh, hard to believe, we only have two reported cases in relation to gender identity in asylum. The first case is Rahimi in 2006, where the uh, court uh, found quite clearly in using positive language that because the individual referred to as a transsexual, we would refer to her today as a trans woman, was describing her, herself in the female pronoun, the court were going to use the female pronoun in the language. But what they did do, and that's the incorrect analysis, was find that she would not be at risk because they found in 2006 gay men in Iran not to be at risk. This was clearly wrong because in 2005, the tribunal found in a case called RMMBB that gay men were at risk. In the case of Rahimi, that application was dismissed because they found gay men and transsexuals, they're the same. If, if, one is not at, if gay men are not at risk, transsexuals are not at risk. The second case is AK Iran in 2008. <coughs> in that case, Lord Justice Sedley, one of our most liberal judges, said quite clearly, you can't Confide, uh, define them both together. You have to separate trans issues with issues of sexual orientation. In that case, that case was remitted back to the tribunal and that individual got asylum. But Lord Justice Sedley himself, one of the most liberal judges in our country, referred to the pre-operative trans woman using the male pronoun, because that was his male natal gender. So it shows the mistakes made in gender identity claims in the UK, and that is why it's essential that we have guidance on gender identity cases here in the UK to be able to actually understand and engage with gender identity issues. But what about sexual identity? So 1951 Refugee Convention, it took, takes the UK until 1999, in the case of Shah and Islam, wait for it, not to look at sexual orientation, but look to include gender as a protected convention reason. So Shah and Islam is about two women, who were from Pakistan, who feared persecution because on the basis of their gender. In the obiter comments of the House of Lords, the breadcrumbs on the judicial table, the House of Lords also said that homosexuals could also be included for the first time. So 48 years after the 1951 convention, the UK House of Lords actually accepts that gay men, and we're being gender specific here, gay men are protected by the Refugee Convention. The first case in the High Court to actually look at the situation on sexual orientation asylum claims was a Court of Appeal case called Jane in 1999. And what I usually do is have some audience participation, but because of the time uh, and, and the numbers, are, I won't. But what happens here in Jane is that there is a continuum. And at one end, you'll have Tahir in Tehran. Tahir has arrived in the UK because he's escaped prison. And the reason why he was in prison is that the religious police of Basiji barged into his bedroom, found him in bed with his boyfriend, and arrested him. And we know that in Iran, that there is a real risk that not only will he be tortured in prison, but that he will face the death penalty. Where David is sitting, let's pretend David is Victor from Vancouver. And I think we should all offer to, um, Victor from Vancouver our congratulations because Victor's just recently got engaged to his boyfriend and will be getting married. So congratulations to Victor. 
it's going to be a rather expensive wedding. He's going to invite us all to, to come over and, and join the celebration. Mm -hmm. Victor not only knows that he could get married to his boyfriend in Vancouver, but when he goes into work on a Monday morning, and if he suffers any homophobic discrimination or violence, he can report the matter to his employer. And if his employer doesn't do anything to rectify the situation, Victor can sue the employer under anti-discrimination legislation. So Victor clearly is not a refugee. He's at what we call the free end of the Jane continuum. The question for the courts is, when you have your LGBTI asylum seeker, are they closer to Tahir in Tehran, or are they closer to Victor in Vancouver? What then happened was the development of the case law, which actually put the UK back in the dark ages. It allowed the United Kingdom's Home Office and judicial decision makers to say that LGB, and not TI, because regarding TI, trans and intersex, they were not going to be sent back to their countries of origin and be discreet, because you can't be discreet as a trans person when you're going through your transition, because your official documents will say one gender, and your actual appearance and your form and who you are will describe another gender. But regarding sexual identity claims, what it said was, from an Australian case called SV95, they said, if you are discreet, and that's voluntarily discreet, is that reasonably tolerable? So in the case of Z, the Zimbabwe gay man who came to the Court of Appeal after two further appeals, these appeals usually take many years because they bounce from the high courts back to the tribunals and back to the high courts. In the case of Z, he didn't give evidence of why discretion would not be tolerable. In the case of Amari, the lesbian from Ethiopia, she was told all you would suffer was social disapproval, not persecution. In a case of R.G. Columbia, a case of mine, the gay man from Columbia was told, you can go back to Columbia and be discreet, because you were discreet for the 13 years before you came to the United Kingdom. And you can go back to Columbia and continue to be discreet, even though the Home Office accepted that there were vigilante death squads who were supported by the police. And even though the Court of Appeal saw in the evidence a psychiatric report said that if R.G. went back to Columbia, he would suffer a mental breakdown due to concealment. After R.G., the Court of Appeal case called J developed the test for discretion and said quite clearly, this is paragraph 16, first, first of all, the tribunal have to ask itself whether discretion is something that the appellant can reasonably be expected to tolerate, not only in the context of random sexual activity, but in relation to matters flown from and relevant to sexual identity. And the problem with that is how do you measure what is reasonably tolerable? Are we going to force gay men and lesbians to go to psychiatrists and say we will all suffer from nervous breakdowns if we go back to our countries of origin and be discreet? Let's realise a fact. There's the human condition. It's a flight or fight issue regarding adrenaline. And the majority of us, and this is a truism, the majority of us, if we were faced with real harm, we would choose to go away from that harm. We would flee rather than fight. It's not really chosen because it's forced on us because of that fear. And the problem was that from 2004, in the case of Z, right up to the Supreme Court decision which we're going to talk about in a moment, July 2010, gay men, lesbians and bisexual asylum seekers would said, look, you're going to be discreet. Not that we're forcing you to be discreet, because that's unlawful. You are going to be discreet, and that's fine. We even have the tribunal in a case called AT Iran saying, in a civilised society, Mankind is expected to conduct his behaviour with a modicum of discretion. That case involved, uh, resulted in a lot of complaints from UK uh, NGOs such as UK Lesbian Gay Immigration Group and Stonewall, because the decision also said uh, we do not understand homosexuals or, or the way of homosexuals at 2005. But then for six years, LGB asylum seekers were turned back to their countries of origin and told you will be discreet and that will be reasonably tolerable. 
That, of course, all changed in July 2010 with HJ and HT. Few facts. HJ, it was originally J in 2006, goes back to the Court of Appeal in 2009 with HT Cameroon. Lord Justice Peel says to the appellants, well, when we're looking at discretion, we must also consider the religious, cultural, and social mores of the country of origin. So we're looking at Islamic Iran, or we're looking at Roman Catholic Cameroon. We must respect what they have as their social, moral, cultural sphere on how to behave. H.J. was a 40-year-old gay man from Iran, he accepted that he's gay by the tribunals. He was identified as gay at school and had problems at school. But the rest of his narrative in relation to persecution at the hands of the Iranian state was completely disbelieved. It's called the barbecues in the back garden case because there's one wonderful passage in the tribunal's determination that said, well, he was able to have barbecues in his back garden with his boyfriend and his family, so he will be fine. And that's why it's called the barbecues in the back garden case. H.T. was a gay man from Cameroon. He lived his life completely discreetly, but unfortunately, on a warm summer's evening in Cameroon. He was in his back garden with his boyfriend, and due to the wonderful moonlight and the stars, he kissed his boyfriend. Unfortunately, one of his neighbors saw him kissing his boyfriend. The word spread. The neighbors started talking. The neighbors started jeering and shouting names at him. The following July, on his way back from church, a mob gathered, and they decided to beat him and kick him. Somebody had a knife, branched a knife, and tried to cut off his penis. He had to protect his genitals by covering them with his hands and got cut there. The police arrived. What's going on here? When they were told they were beating a homosexual, what did the police do? Did they protect HT? No. They joined in the beating. HT was hospitalized for two months and then managed to escape through a friend of the church. He comes to the UK, the Glasgow Tribunal says, we accept everything which happened to you. Totally. You were identified as gay, you were beaten by not only the mob, but by also the police. But you can live somewhere else in Cameroon and be discreet. So these cases come to the Supreme Court. And I can tell you, taking straight in our jurisprudence with gay rights, in the House of Lords as they were, we weren't very hopeful, we were slightly worried. We're, we're dealing with five Supreme Court justices, men in their 70s in suits, white, Oxbridge educated, nobody's gaydar went bing in the, in the Supreme Court chamber. So what were we dealing with? Were we dealing with an up-to-date court which actually could engage with issues? My goodness, July 2010, they hand down this judgment which is revolutionary. What they say at paragraph 53 of the judgment, this Lord Roger, who, in relation to this, uh, this case, provides the most important uh, reasoning and guidance. What he says in this, the underlying section there is that the underlying rationale of the Convention is therefore that people should be able to live freely without fearing that they may suffer harm of the requisite intensity or duration because they are, say, black or the descendants of some gay dictator, uh, sorry, former dictator, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm, I'm wrong. maybe that's it, um, former dictator, or gay. Revolutionary. This is the first time the Supreme Court talks about being gay. It's the first time the Supreme Court talks about being a lesbian asylum seeker. And it is the first time a higher court decision ever refers to the term <laughs> bisexual. So what it says is that we're here to protect people to be able to live openly and freely. At paragraph 77, when he talks about what it means to be discreet and how a straight person would not accept such discretion, look at the underlying passage, it says, not only would he not be able to indulge openly the mild flirtations, which are an enjoyable part of heterosexual uh, life, a um, few of my straight female friends would argue that the flirtations aren't always that mild, but he would have to think twice before revealing that he was attracted to another man Similarly, the small tokens and gestures of affection which are taken for granted between men and women could well be dangerous. We then go to one of the most controversial paragraphs. Oh, sorry, apologise. An Englishman, Irishman and Scotsman go to a bar. A barman asks a Scotsman, 
Do you recognize that? It's an example of British humor. Yes? You'd agree, so it's a joke. You would laugh at that. Well, let's look at paragraph 78. So what Lord Roger says is, what are we looking at? We're looking at the actual situation about what it actually means. And just before the highlighted section, just as male heterosexuals are free to enjoy themselves playing rugby, drinking beer, and talking about girls with their mates, so male homosexuals are to be free to enjoy themselves going to Kylie concerts, drinking exotically coloured cocktails, and talking about boys with their straight female mates. Now, mutatis mutandis, so everything by being equal with the, with the uh, required change, in many cases the adaptations would be obviously great. What Lord Rogers not saying is that everybody has a right to go out and go to Kylie concerts or drink exotically coloured cocktails. What Lord Rogers is trying to do, in, which I interpret as being a bit of British humour, is saying, look at the equality but difference in relation to behaviour. And what we're not looking at are peripheral conduct. We're not saying that people should be protected to be able to drink cocktails or listen to Kylie. And please note, uh, the gay gossip at the time was that initially the reference was to Barbara Streisand uh, and then to Kylie Minogue and then just plain Kylie. So clearly Lord Roger had to be educated about gay sensibilities and tastes of some of the gay population. But what we're looking at is protecting the status. It's a protected convention reason of ground. It's the fact that we're protecting sexual identity. Because if the person who does persecute, say, the hypothetical gay man in Uganda listening to Kylie, drinking a cosmopolitan, it's not going to be persecuted because the persecutor hates Kylie Minogue, or that the persecutor thinks that cosmopolitans are too bitter, but that that is a person who's not conforming to what the persecutor views as a heterosexual narrative. And we'll develop that further. What Lord Roger was doing in providing guidelines was to look at how courts would look at cases which involve sexual orientation sexual identity. The first issue is, is the person gay or perceived to be gay? And that's a very important point to note. Now, noting that UKBA in refusal letters, and I do know that we've got friends from UKBA here today, good afternoon, is that we had tons of refusal letters which said, we accept you're gay or lesbian, but you can go and be discreet because that was the, the formulation of the policy of the UK border agency. But what we now find is, since HHT, that this is the battleground, proving sexual identity. Because if you look at limb two, is that would openly gay men be liable to persecution in the applicant's country of nationality? Why is that important? Because if you're in Uganda, there are very few people who can be open about their sexual identity. And when we have people like David Cato, who was murdered in January 2011 because of his sexual identity, and other activists who are routinely tortured or raped, this is what happens when you're open in Uganda. So the Supreme Court was taking a very important step to realize that in the lives of lesbian and gay people, it's not, well, because you're not open, you aren't persecuted. It's that if there's a real risk that if you are open, this is what happens to you. We're looking at the objective fear. Lord Roger was then saying in the third limb, would that individual actually live openly? So in the fight and flight scenario, there are some individuals who will actually fight. And we'll go on to look at a case called SW Jamaica, where the tribunal said, look, you're putting the genie back in the bottle. This individual appellant, this lesbian from Jamaica, is going to be open on return, even though it may lead to uh, persecution. However, the court recognised would that person actually behave discreetly? Limb four, and I actually have to say, for the record, in 10 years of litigating these cases, I have never dealt with a case where the only reason is family or social pressure. And we must remember that part of family pressure could be honor killing, and that amounts to persecution. So family or social pressure is quite an interesting paradigm. But what the Supreme Court says is that if the only reason is because of family and social pressure, then the individual is not a refugee. There arises a lacuna, which I'm going to submit to you all, 
is now being filled by SW Jamaica and issues of heteronormativity. But what's important there is that the Supreme Court is saying there's, a, there's going to be this group which we envisage are not going to be at risk. However, the Supreme Court says in Lim 5, if, that, if a material reason for living discreetly would be the fear of persecution, then the individual is a refugee. So there could be many reasons. Well, my, my dad and mum won't like it, and the mob will kill me. You win, you pass, go, you get refugee status. And those are the limits which Lord Roger provided in relation to this point. This analysis in relation to risk has provided quite extreme and important and engaging academic commentary. In the next week or so, uh, James Hathaway and Jason Popjoy are publishing an article in the New York Jur University Journal of International Law and Politics entitled Queer Cases Make Bad Law. And there are six or seven academic commentaries in relation to this, which are also being published in that special edition, I think volume 44, number two, or something like that. Um, if you go on the New York University Journal website and go to the Open Juris blog, you will find several other papers in relation to a symposium, which happened last Thursday and Friday, and yours truly uh, submitted a paper as well in relation to this point. What they're saying is that if you're voluntarily discreet, then where's the exogenous harm? Where's the actual fear of the actual beating? What they're saying is what you need to show is severe psychological trauma, severe trauma in the form of endogenous harm. Now the problem what I've got a uh, problem I've got with that analysis is that the UK courts have already rejected that in RG Columbia. Because in RG there was psychiatric evidence that he would suffer a mental breakdown if he returned back and was concealing himself. But also, the problem I find with that analysis is that it ignores the fact that in relation to what is known as the heterosexual narrative, and we'll deal with that in SW in a few moments, is that what is actually involved is not mere discretion, it's not mere lack of peripheral conduct, i.e. the listening to the Kylie music or drinking the Cosmopolitan. What would actually be involved is aggressive engagement with a straight life. It will involve, in a lot of societies, actually marrying or being receptive to an opposite sex partner and having children. It's not just merely refraining from, it's actual engagement with a heteronormative life to evade harm. And when Popjoy and uh, Hathaway talk about referring to making minor changes to peripheral conduct, I think they miss the point. These are not minor changes to peripheral conduct. We're looking at state identity. The battleground is now proving sexual identity even before we get to the last limb. And when I travel and I'm asked by different NGOs or organisations, provide us with a questionnaire. Give us 40 questions we can ask a, a possible LGB asylum seeker to be able to prove their LGB. I say over my dead body. Absolutely no way. You can never have a question. What happens if somebody answers 19 out of 40? Does that mean that they're not gay enough? What happens if they answer 39 out of 40? Either they are truly gay or they've got a very good gay friend. How does that prove anything? I'll share a little story with you. Um, when I was nine years old, I had a birthday party. And for my birthday cake, I asked my mother that I wanted a special birthday cake. I wanted a birthday cake with blue marzipan icing and roses and butterflies. Because that's what I wanted. I was nine years old and I liked roses and butterflies. When it came to my birthday party, after that the twelfth girl who came in, because I had lots of girlfriends, my brother just ran to the door and said, another girl? Now what was I doing there? Was I saying that I was a man, a, a, a nine-year-old who was involved in a sexual relationship with another man? No. But what I was doing is not conforming to a heterosexual narrative in relation to what a boy should do. And when you read the stories and the statements of LGB asylum seekers, you'll find the development of this narrative in what I call the DISH model. And what does DISH stand for? It stands for difference, stigma, shame, and harm. And in the majority of LGB's narratives, 
The majority of people who serve the course is always an exception, will have the different stigma of shame. What makes a refugee is the heart. So let's look at different. And it comes from very early on in the story, prior to any revelation regarding sexual desire. But we're looking at recognition that not like other boys or girls with respect to personal sex, gender, role development. Looking at, you're looking at recognition of gender difference in gender identity. I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl in relation to my biological gender, but I want to wear boys' clothes and I want to play with boys' toys. And there are all sorts of issues which identify and trigger difference in the narrative. So I'm not saying there's a list of questions, get a detailed narrative regarding how the recognition of difference. There will never be the answer to the question, when did you realise that you were gay or lesbian? Because it's a gradual development. And the use of those terms, if you're in Jamaica, you may not even know those terms because it's a language of hate. Because in Jamaica, lesbian is known as a sodomite. So we have to be very cultural sensitive, sensitive in relation to the terminology, and we also have to be sensitive to the fact that part of the narrative is non-sexual and is not connected to conduct. It's conduct connected to development of the self, and that's very important. And what, what I define it as not living a heterosexual narrative. Then you have the stigma, I am different, and recognition that close family members or friends or the neighbours disapprove of that. You recognise that the majority of people, so you're not conforming to what you're expected to in the life plan, would find that wrong. You recognise that there are state, cultural and religious mores and laws which are directed towards LGBTIs. This brings the shame, and this is the impact of stigma, to feelings associated with isolation, the impact of being the other, not the same. This will not lead to 99.9% .9 of LGBTs in the world going to the mental asylum. Why does it need to cross that threshold? It's a recognition that there is this shame connected with the stigma flowing from the difference. And then, of course, we have the harm. And when it comes to state harm, it's in relation to criminalization, fear of arrest, torture, and detention. And then non-state agent harm, more violence, and family, and honor killing. So let's look at concepts rather than question, a list of questions. It's very important be able to engage with that, it's very important to be able to get a detailed narrative. Terminology is so important. We're in 2012. Amazing, isn't it? But for some people, they still use the term homosexual. Purely conduct first analysis. And that's why in the UK and the global north, there are terms such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, as in trans man or trans woman, or intersex. We don't use the term transsexual. We use trans in relation to also information of gender identity. And one of the reasons why it's so important is that if you look at the skeleton argument before the Supreme Court in HT, what they said quite importantly is that the word gay is preferred to the word homosexual for much the same reasons as the word black is preferred to the word negro for descriptive purposes of a particular sexual orientation as for a particular race or ethnicity. Clearly, no one in this room, and I hope no one in this room, would want to use the Negro term in relation to race identity. And that's the amount of hate connected with the term homosexual in relation to these terms, because it's all related to conduct, it's all, always related to the minority subclass, it's always related to the deviant. And we've gone past that. We don't call Stonewall the homosexual rights group, we talk about the gay rights lobby group, we don't talk about the UK homosexual immigration group, we call the UK lesbian and gay immigration group. So terminology is very important, but it's also important to enable the individual to self-identify. Uh, but what really happens here is it that the individual is on the streets, dancing around, tight t-shirts, and singing ABBA? No, it's not that at all, and we know that. It's about perception. And that's why I say perception is key because we all live in a heteronormative society. And that's what we're looking at quite specifically. So when the UNHCR guidance note in 2002 talks about gender nonconformity, they had it right. It's the fact that 
Gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals, trans and intersex people do not conform to what society expects a straight person to conform to in that society. Um, my Hindu mother always told me um, three things about God when she was teaching my young brother and I about religion. She said, God says three things, yes, no, or later. And I always believe that it's the same with the courts here in the UK. It's yes, no, we'll come back later. Uh, and uh, this is a, an example of this. In 2005, in a case called DW Jamaica, the tribunal were looking at the situation of gay men in Jamaica. Uh, and uh, David and I were talking about the fact that it's so difficult to get a, a positive come to guidance case sometimes. And DW Jamaica was the third attempt at getting the tribunal to do a uh, come to guidance case on gay men in Jamaica. And what they accepted, you see the underlying sections, there is some force and suggestion that perception is all. So when we look at countries of Jamaica, there is a strong social, cultural, moral, religious uh, demand for conformity that anybody who comes in any way away from that margin of conformity will be at risk. Paragraph 72, they put it this. He put that as those who are not conforming to what Jamaica sees as a norm of masculine identity in Jamaica. Whilst we accept that this formulation may assist in defining those who are thought to be homosexual, it is a wider definition than is required for the purpose of this determination, both on the facts of the appellant's case in relation to expert evidence and country material before us. And what they didn't want to do is enlarge the scope of this country guidance case, which accepted that those who are gay or perceived to be gay in Jamaica are at risk. They didn't want to widen the definition to lesbians or trans people in Jamaica. But wait, June 2011, come back later, SW Jamaica, case in relation to lesbians from Jamaica. This is a very important case because it's a case which comes after 8J and HT in 2010. Why is it also very important? It addresses the lacuna which I identified in Lim 4. Because the Supreme Court said in Lim 4, if you're only discreet because of family or social pressure, you are not a refugee. But the upper tribunal in SW Jamaica Realised in the case of Jamaica, and I would argue fits most countries, is that even a straight woman who would not be able to display, uh, sorry, limb force, single women with no male partner or children risk being perceived as lesbian, whether or not that is the case, unless they present a heterosexual narrative and behave with discretion. And in Jamaica, that is quite important because it's a very aggressive heterosexual narrative. So, for example, I'll pretend to be persecuted Jamaican man, and for the moment, let's pretend David is is innocent Jamaican woman, straight woman. So I go, oh, no children. Uh, I'm Jamaican man, Jamaican woman, Jamaican man, Jamaican woman. No children, no partner. Hi, I've come calling. I'm interested in you, Jamaican woman. Now, whatever Jamaican woman thinks about my attractiveness, pausing there, Jamaican woman, even if she's not interested in me, if she's not receptive to me calling, the other tribunal accepts that there's a real risk of curative rape, even murder. Because you're going to be cured. I'm a Jamaican man. You must all want me because I'm a Jamaican man. And of course, we're limiting ourselves to the persecutory straight Jamaican man. Okay? I'm not saying this for all Jamaican men. Of course I'm not. But for the persecutory straight Jamaican man, if you are not receptive, you need to be cured. I will cure you by raping you. So that clearly fills the whole issue, is that it's not only lesbians in Jamaica who are at risk, but also any straight woman who does not adopt an aggressive heteronormative identity. Now let's look at the government response to HHT, and that's why I'm saying it's about the fast developing world of um, LGBT asylum. In April 2010, the UK Lesbian Gay Immigration Group found that 98 to 99% of initial decisions were refused in LGBT claims. That compared to 73% in relation to non-LGBT claims. And the majority of those refusals were, you can conceal yourself and be discreet. I even had one Jamaican client where the UKBA refusal letter said, well, you, you actually outraged public behavior because you wore a skirt and you went down to the town and danced around. So no wonder they burnt your house down. This was an actual paragraph in the refusal letter, refusing asylum status for my client. 
So it's all your fault, because if you hadn't behaved in that way, they wouldn't have burnt your house down. This is the 21st century in relation to the way decisions are being made. But of course, on the 20th of May 2010, following the coalition government's installation, the Equalities Manifesto said quite clearly, we will stop the deportation of asylum seekers who have had to leave particular countries because their sexual orientation or gender identity puts them at proven risk of imprisonment, torture, or execution. Pause there. Any change in the law? No, there's no newsflash. Absolutely not. This is exactly what the law has been since 1999. It doesn't say anything about discretion. Proven that they will be at risk. Note the use of term. Note that from the Supreme Court case was heard on the 10th to the 12th of May 2010. Of course, why is the 12th of May important? That's the first day of the new government. So we all attend the Supreme Court thing. Come on, Liberal Democrat coalition. Come on, change of instructions. Come on. No, they were still fighting the case. And even after the Equalities Manifesto, there was no positive response saying, well, we're going to change our instructions because we no longer believe this. They still continued with the litigation. But then, of course, after the Supreme Court decision on the 7th of July, Ian Cheeseman from NAM provided a memo to say, we will change from immediate effect. And this is an important watershed, because there has been no case which has had this sort of effect in relation to government policy. No such case at all which actually said, we will now make sure we never do this again. Of course, there will be exceptions, but in the main, there was a huge honeymoon period where a lot of clients were being granted refugee status, where had they had been told before, you can go back and be discreet, because that was the only issue. You can go back and be discreet, and that would be reasonably tolerable. If we turn over the page, it took two years for the asylum instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity to be published, and this is a breakthrough document. This is the first time we have a document which actually addresses sexual orientation. Of course, in July 2011, the two documents split, and now we have the one asylum instruction on sexual orientation and the other on gender identity. It's very important because it looks at the issues regarding credibility, it looks at the issues of late disclosure, it looks at the interview process, it looks at the difference between discrimination and persecution. And I very much recommend you having a look at that uh, in the next few days or weeks. There has been training of case owners and presenting officers of UK border agency. There's also been training of immigration judges. And there has been dialogue with country of origin information reports. But a lot of work still needs to be done. For example, because lesbians have a double blind in a lot of countries of origin, because they're first persecuted for their gender and sexual identity, there may be instances where there's no evidence of persecution of lesbians, and that's because no lesbians can be out. And what we say is that if you find persecution of gay men, it is highly likely that there will be persecution of lesbians. But at the moment, the COI unit wants us to provide academic commentary on that, and we will still have to uh, provide that. On the 21st of December 2010, that's why I say it had such a profound impact on political involvement, Theresa May actually wrote to the Immigration Law Practitioners Association and actually said that she is committed personally to making sure that this message is communicated to all key partners, that discretion cannot be employed in relation to such cases to force people into places of persecution. But then what happens from discretion to disbelief? This is taken from a title um, from an academic paper called Jenny Milbank, talking about what happened in Australia after S395, is that, well, you can be discreet to, we, can, we do not believe that you're lesbian or gay. The Court of Appeal in February last month said this, the question of proving, uh, the question of sexual orientation, which of course may be separate from questions of sexual conduct of any kind, of no or of no sexual conduct at all, is a matter of fact like any other matter of fact. Uh, this is Lord Justice Riggs. Sexual conduct, the way in which one lives a life, the reports of friends, all these things may bear upon the issue. None of them may, of course, be conclusive, although some of them might be viewed as being very powerful. What Lord Justice Riggs accepted is that it should not be a matter of psychiatric evidence to prove sexual identity. The problem with VO is that she said that she had been a victim of a gang rape, and in the narrative to the psychiatrist, she said, because of that gang rape, she never had any future sexual interests in men, and only had sexual interests in women. And the first year tribunal found, well, the psychiatrist hasn't accepted that as a matter of fact. Very troubled by 
what happened in the, in the courts below in relation to VO Nigeria. But worryingly, on the next page to see, is that in the asylum instruction, it importantly says that self-identification should be enough. If there isn't self-identification, then you go into questions in relation to establishing sexual identity. But Lord Justice Rick says, in my judgment, that does not matter to recognition of self-identification as being enough. It is simply a starting point. So we've got a worrying development of the law there in relation to self-identification being enough. Now, of course, you will all say, what about those who are bogus? Uh, the Immigration Asylum Tribunal in 2000, in a case called Appellant Z, said in allowing the appeal to that Zimbabwe client, which eventually went to court appeal, but allowing that uh, situation, well, the, I won't name the judge, but the tribunal said, well, of course, you know, we're not going to have the floodgates opening here, because why would anybody want to, begging the phraseology of the Marcus Queensbury, want to pose as a sodomite? So the tribunal said, well, why would anybody want to pose as a gay man, using far more colourful language. So that's quite interesting because the tribunal said, well, why, why would there be bogus gay and lesbian asylum seekers? Because it's such a horrible thing to admit to. That's in 2000. Now, UK lesbian gay immigration group Erin Power said at a public meeting two weeks ago that out of the 1,000 LGBTI individuals they've seen in the past 12 months, they estimate only 1 or 2% would be not telling them a true account in relation to their asylum claim. So the numbers are very, very small. That's why we say self-identification self should be enough. Also very worrying, in January this year, was a case called LZ Zimbabwe, country guidance from Zimbabwe. And what they say is some homosexuals suffer discrimination, harassment, and blackmail from the general public and the police. <coughs> Attempted extortion, false complaints, and unjustified detentions are not so prevalent as to pose a general risk. There are no records of any murders with a homophobic element. Corrective rape is rare, but it exists. Corrective rape is rare and does not represent a general risk. Well, limb two of eight JHT is not what is the general risk, what is the risk to those who are open? In looking, look, using the approach of SW Jamaica, the British Embassy official <coughs> interviewed a representative from the Women of Zimbabwe Arise organization in a Harare. And the question he asked her was, is it socially acceptable for two men to live together? Would they experience societal discrimination as perceived gays? Answer, generally it would be acceptable for two men to live together, and it would be assumed that they were relatives, friends, or from the same village. It would not necessarily be assumed they were homosexual. Well, the question is, what would happen if they lived openly as a gay couple? That's what's at issue in HHT. Now, the reason why this case is very, very dangerous, of course, is because in LZ, the lesbian asylum seeker from Zimbabwe actually won her appeal. So there is somebody in Zimbabwe who can win their appeal on sexual orientation, sexual identity. So is that person the open individual who is at risk and therefore should be the comparison in relation to limb two? The problem with that, of course, is that because the appeal has been allowed, the appellants aren't able to appeal that. And as, I, as far as I understand, I, I don't think the uh, Secretary of State is appealing that decision either, because in general it says gay men and lesbians are not at risk. It's a troubling case. What else is troubling, of course, is questions which are still used even after immigration judges have been trained. In September 2011, um, an immigration judge, I'm smiling, an immigration, uh, and, and the person who knows why I'm smiling, the immigration judge asked the barrister to a Pakistani lesbian client who said that she'd come out at 13. How does a lesbian come out at 13? Well, the next question is, how does a straight woman come out at 13? How do we all find out our sexual identity? The next question asked by an immigration judge in Hatton Cross in May 2010 is, when did you first engage in buggery with your boyfriend? That case was successfully appealed to the upper tribunal, which found that sort of questioning perverse. But this is 2010. And when the immigration judge was taken to task in relation to the use of the term buggery, well, it's known by that by some people, isn't it? In April 2012, in Taylor House, the presenting officer, who it's great presenting because I've known him for years, and we've done sexual identity cases before, and the first thing he said, yes, Mr. Chilman, you don't like that homosexual word, do you? It's gay, isn't it? 
I said, yes, Mr. Insert Name. He said, great, because I've had the training. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Now, unfortunately, my gay Ugandan client had been through the fast track process, had no time to present his appeal, had lost his fast track appeal, went through all the negative determinations refusing him leave to appeal, and then the legal team, uh, which I was part of, came in, and we were managed to find his friends who weren't able to come to the hearing, and they were able to talk about his life in the UK. And his life in the UK was pretty graphic and pretty open, and he went to bars in Vauxhall in South London, where you only wear your underwear with his friends. And it was pretty obvious from his statement that when he went to these bars with these other friends that he may be attracted to men, putting it no more. But he had a very close friend, and he went to his close friend's house, and they watched DVDs together. So he bought the DVDs to show the female immigration judge, but they watched these DVDs, and they do things together. So the, the, so the presenting officer said after he disclosed that he did things together, you can imagine what that was, and, and, and the presenting officer said, well, did you do anything intimate with him? And my client says, well, wanking is intimate. So these are sort of the issues in relation to having now prove your identities goes to such extremes. The immigration judge actually said in her determination, that's the bottom part of that page, the appellant has unfortunately been forced into presenting evidence of his activities and lifestyle in significant detail. In this case, the sexual behaviour is, I consider, merely the means by which the appellant has confirmed and proven his sexual identity. This shouldn't be the way in which gay and lesbian clients and refugees should have to prove their sexual identity. It's back to the dish model rather than the dirt model. This is what we should be really looking at, looking at the narrative in relation to the development of identity. What we have on a European level is development of the law, both positive and negative. In the past six weeks, the governments of Finland, the Netherlands and France have been communicated the following cases in relation to LGB cases. Finland regarding an Iranian national, where they said he can be discreet and, and use internal relocation. In the Netherlands, in the Dutch case, the Jamaican national said, look, his, his picture and name have been published in the Jamaican papers, everybody knows I'm gay. In AL in France, the Cameroonian man fears persecution because of arrest due to criminalisation. So that's all been communicated to the Strasbourg uh, to the governments in February and late January, so we'll have to wait to see what happens with those cases. We know that the only case which was on the books uh, in relation to admissibility is F in UK, which is 2004, which says that gay men in Iran are fine. And then another case called DBN in UK, which is about a Zimbabwe uh, national, but that case was not continued because of loss of contact with the client. What is frightening is that the European Court of Justice, the Court of Justice of the European Union, has recently heard submissions of a case called Y and Federal Republic of Germany. That case is not a gay case, but it involves a Mardi's. And it's the same sort of issue in relation to discretion. And what the Strasbourg, uh, sorry, the Luxembourg Court has been asked is, is the applicant to be expected to abstain from engaging in such religious practices in the future with respect to peripheral conduct, not core conduct? And this case will have binding implications to even UK courts because of the 2004 Qualification Directive, because it looks at the definition of persecution under Article 9. There is an argument which I favour regarding the fact that the 2004 directive is the minimum standards, and we can employ more favourable standards, which is different from the recast of the directive, which happens at the moment. We talk about common standards, and the UK has not opted in into the recast directive. But we'll have to wait to see what the European Court does about that. Future cases in the UK, at the end of this month, the case called Brown. At the moment, there's called a white list, a safe list, of countries where individuals can automatically be put through for the detained fast track procedure. One of the countries, and you'll be surprised by this, is Jamaica. Now, I first visited a case called Hilton in 2003, which tried to challenge the Jamaican case. And the Home Office barrister said, only men who go to cruise, or those who are prostitutes, are the risk group. Now, 10 years later, when I'm thinking about things, I said, well, most gay men cruise, so aren't all gay men at risk. But in 2003, Lord Justice Richards, Lord, sorry, just Mr. Justice Richards, as he then was, said no to permission. But Brown will actually look at challenging the certification of Jamaica, Jamaica as a whole, and then secondly, Jamaica in relation to lesbian and gay men, especially as now we have two country guidance cases. Not one, but two country guidance cases which identify lesbian and gay men at risk. 
AJ has had so much application to all the convention reasons, so, so much important, such important implication to all convention reasons. In RT Zimbabwe, the Court of Appeal last year said that if you do not have ZANU PF alignment and you're forced to lie about such alignment, and that lie is due to your fear of persecution, then, according to HAHT, you are a refugee. Secretary of State has appealed that decision, and on the 18th and 19th of June, a seven panel Supreme Court will convene to hear that case. So it's not the five panel of HJ, it's now the seven, seven panel. There could be arguments in relation to whether having to lie about a political allegiance has got anything to do with core identity. We'll have to wait to see what the Supreme Court does. And at the end of this month, in case of Ahmadis in the upper tribunal, in case of NM and others, will also look at religious proselytizing and issues regarding what's going on there. The Fleeing Homophobia Project, and I will finish in, in, in the next minute, the Fleeing Homophobia Project was a landmark project which brought 26 member states together to actually compare and contrast how LGBTI claims are determined in Europe. And what it ascertained is that thousands of LGBTI asylum seekers come to Europe to claim asylum every year. And the recommendations were, and these are quite controversial, far-reaching recommendations, but that we should grant protection to all LGBTIs where criminal laws prohibiting same-sex conduct exist. Not where they're enforced, but because where they exist. If you go on to the Ilga World Report on Homophobia, they now colour the countries of the world which have criminal laws in red, saying this is where persecution exists. There's no need to seek state protection in non-state agent claims where criminal laws exist. There's no, no, no to application or concealment or discretion. Self-identification is enough to establish identity and accurate country information. There also needs to be protection in reception centres. This is not only for LGBT asylum seekers who are outed or found out regarding sexual identity, but specifically also in gender identity cases. I had a trans male client who basically was in a female detention centre and because the other inmates, or I say inmates, other detainees were uh, com uh, questioning his gender, this is a trans man, they actually went up to him and pushed their arms on his chest to check whether he had breasts or not. And that's the sort of abuse you get in detention centres day after day for LGBT asylum seekers. So in the end, I hope you've uh, found that within this, hopefully sh this short presentation, you've actually engaged in what it actually means to be an LGBTI asylum seeker. That it's not about drinking coloured cocktails, going to Kylie concerts and talking about men with your female mates. It's about actually having to suffer the harm and indignity and a life of secrecy and lies, not for one day, not for one week, but for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheldon, for what was, in a relatively short space of time, really a run through of the whole gamut of issues which seem to be raised in these particular kinds of cases, and which perhaps haven't been properly dealt with by courts, um, and are only starting to, to engage those sorts of wider types of thinking that should be applied to them. Um, before I open up to the floor for questions, I suppose my first question is, thinking back even 10, 12 years when I started in practice, it would have, I think, been very difficult to have seen a judgment like H.J. Iran. And I wondered if perhaps one of the reasons why this judgment had come about at the present time was the, the increasing influence of human rights law in refugee law, and whether this isn't part of a, a symptom of that. I say that simply because in my reading of H.J. Iran, the idea that um, particular kinds of identity form protected human rights seemed to be a critical part of the reasoning, at least in some of the, um, the judgments of the, of the Supreme Court. And I wonder whether or not that also might account for some of its wider implications. It's also about its implications in cases like RT Zimbabwe in terms of thinking through the implications of political opinion. I wonder if it would have been rather difficult to think about courts taking these sorts of steps without having the buttress 
of the human rights language there behind them. And before opening up to the floor for, for other questions, I wondered if you might say, if I could draw you a little bit about that, on your considerable expertise. Well, in, in 2006, Lord Laws, in the case of Amari, the lesbian from Ethiopia, said that quoting from a human rights perspective is, is going beyond what was the consensus with the contracting parties. And then when it came to the Supreme Court case, there was, of course, the New Zealand case um, called Refugee Appeals Number 76445-03. They always have these wonderful serial numbers. About a gay man from Iran, where Roger Haynes specifically looks at it from a human rights perspective. And what the Supreme Court says is that is an argument for another day. Uh, and uh, very much concentrated on the Appellant S395 approach in um, Australia, the High Court of Australia decision on two gay men from Bangladesh, saying it, it is wrong to separate those who are discrete from those who are non discrete as being two separate groups. So they weren't, they specifically rejected a human rights approach at that time. What the Supreme Court may do in June with RT Zimbabwe it is, is another matter. But for, in relation to a human rights approach with respect to the Refugee Convention, that wasn't a point specifically addressed in, in HJNHT. Okay, I'm opening up to questions, comments. Uh, if you could raise your hand and we'll take one question at a time. Okay, yeah, Paul. Paul Delay from the Refugee Program at Amnesty International. You said that we've moved to a situation now where it's proving sexuality is a battleground. Um, we have these various tools, the APIs, API for sexual orientation, the API for gender identity for use by case owners. In your experience, is it the application of the tool which is problematic in this uh, post HJHT, in the immediate post HJHT period? Is case owners are not as skilled as they might be yet in applying the tools to the cases that come before them? You, you know that we at Amnesty provide opinions uh, in LGBT, well, LGB cases to date. Uh, and in the vast majority of all the cases which have come before us, mostly Uganda, there is never any explicit reference to the API, whereas the OGN says you must refer to it, you must take it into account. So they don't refer to the API, and if they are applying it, the outcome is very unusual because it doesn't seem to be applied in the spirit of what you would expect. So is it the tools that are problematic, or is there something deficient within the tools which still need to be remedied? And also, when we talk about the tribunal, because of their lack of tools, obviously the APIs you know, aren't, don't have the same impact on the IJ. When we still see, for example, the tribunal in LZ Zimbabwe saying expressly, we know what the terminology is, but we've decided we still want to say homosexuality. I find that very unusual and disappointing why the tribunals decide to do that in the post HJHT period. Well, if I move to the last point, um, because it links with the first point, in, in LT Zimbabwe there's no reference to the asylum instruction at all on such an orientation, um, which should have forced the presenting officers to say, look, we use lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex. Mm -hmm. And importantly enough, in November 2005, after DW's uh, submissions, the country of origin information reports stopped using homosexual and transsexuals and using lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex. So the Home Office has been using the correct terminology, I'd say correct what I prefer um, since November 2005. Um, but it's interesting when you read the whole LZ LS, LS Zimbabwe case, even though they say that in the earlier paragraphs we'll be using male homosexuals and female homosexuals, they do split into talking about gays and lesbians at certain points. So there's some divergence in relation to that, as there is in HAHT. Um, with respect to tools, I mean, the API is very limited in, in, on the basis that it says the starting point should be self-identification, Otherwise, there should be first, further investigation. Now, the point is, what is the further investigation, and how does that go? And unfortunately, I've read some of the um, interviews of post HAAT caseworkers, and I'm horrified. I mean, it's almost on the, the pornographic. Um, it's just absolutely, you know, it's, it's degrading. It's inhuman. Now, yes, you have to say, as a political, if you have hold a political opinion, you have to test up the political opinion. In, is genuine, but you don't talk about the type of sex an individual had with their, their girlfriend or boyfriend and who did what to who. That, that doesn't happen. Um, so unfortunately, you know, those are the examples that I, I can highlight. And what I hope is you know, 
with the DIS model, UNHCR distribution tools, their European trainers, and I know I've had a meeting with UKBA as well uh, in relation to the DIS model as well to look at the concepts and work around those concepts because in the majority of those claims, you know, different stigma, shame, and harm comes in the majority of those narratives and their detailed narratives. And then on the University of Westminster, two small questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is about, um, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, um, most of these cases, if not all, are decided on the ground of membership to a particular social group. What about religious grounds? Um, because it's, it's by the, listening to all your, your cases, would it be a possible ground? And if so, would there be an advantage in, in relying on this one rather than the, the uh, social group? And my second question is, well, it's not really a question, if you could perhaps expand a little bit on the qualification directive, which you mentioned at the end, and particularly, um, well, it's, it would be Article 15, subsidiary protection, Article 15A and B, uh, fear of, uh, of death penalty or execution, and fear of inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment uh, if returned, and the fact that the UK has opted out of the recast directive. So where will, it, where will it leave all the new applications um, in this new kind of context? Okay. Um, first of all, in relation to religion, of course it can be used, but it will have to be an imputed religious convention reason because they are conforming to a religious norm. So if there's no issue. With respect to that, I don't think it gives greater protection for an LGBT asylum claim. And unless it might be proven to the contrary, I don't think any LGBT asylum claim would not come within a particular social group of actual reason. So I, I don't think there's, there's an issue there. In relation to the qualification directive, uh, Article 10, of course, is problematic, but also helpful. The reason why it's helpful is that it first prescribes that sexual orientation may come within protection. Now, why does it say may rather than shall, might rather than shall? It should say shall, because of course, any arguments regarding uh, child abuse, paedophilia, well, the international community do not accept paedophilia as being a sexual orientation. So there's no reason for sexual orientation to be might rather than shall. The, also, the other problem with um, Article 10 of the Qualification Directive is that when it, it, it's defined in relation to the fact that it doesn't contravene the criminal laws of the member state, so, for example, in the UK, the age of consent is 16. Now, how does a lesbian come out at 13? Well, she's under 16. Is she not a lesbian? But according to Article 10, she cannot get the protection of the registry convention under a particular social group. So children who self-identify as LGBTI, LGB, are not currently protected under Article 10. And that's also very much a battleground which all the Europeans are working hard on, but have failed to convince the European Parliament and other bodies in relation to the recast directive. Um, in relation to Article 15, well, I, I prefer looking at Article 9, because that's also another battleground. Um, in November 2009, the uh, Court of Appeals looked at whether criminalisation by itself would amount to persecution. Look at Article 9b. Because Article 9b is about discriminatory legal administrative measure, and or implemented in a discriminatory way. So the law up to the qualification directive was that latter part of the limb, which says enforcement, but the first part of that limb arguably say, well, the law is discriminatory, it amounts to persecution. Um, the Court of Appeal said no to me at the time, but because they, they said, look, international consensus has not caught up to it, caught up to it, but of course in June 2011, the UN Committee on Human Rights in Geneva specifically passed a resolution regarding criminalisation. So we're going to have to come back to those issues in relation to the definition of persecution, which is to Article 9. Now, in relation to the recast directive, um, I'm worried about the recast directive, and the reason why I'm worried about the recast directive is that it's common standards, rather than minimum standards. And the 2004 qualification directive says minimum standards, but member states can have more faithful standards. If you have pure harmonisation, it provides certain problems in relation to what those common standards are. One of the good things about the recast directive is that for the first time included gender identity under Article 10 for members of a particular social group. But we in the UK 
already recognised gender identities coming under a particular social group before the recast directive, and hence why the, the more favourable standards are held. Um, I'm going to ask you on a question that I think that you might have even talked about about a year ago, when Satvinder gave a talk just in the um, aftermath of the HJ Iran judgment. And that's this idea that, to some extent, Western states are developing their refugee law along a line which wouldn't necessarily be appealing to states in other parts of the world. And I wondered how you would, um, or what views you might care to express, on, just to, to fill in a little bit. For example, the idea of extending refugee status on the basis of gender protection, protection of sexual identity, would be controversial, to say the least, in certain parts of the world, um, you know, like if you're an HCR, for example. And how might one approach that when thinking about the Refugee Convention as a kind of global tool? Or do we resign ourselves to a fraction of refugee law beyond what already exists? Um, uh, Lord, Lord Hope um, said at the beginning of HJHT, paragraph 2, he said, look, you know, the frames of convention wanted to ignore persecution on grounds of sexual identity, and they did this on purpose because they wanted to pretend it didn't exist. And then in paragraph 3 of his judgment, the speech, he says specifically, our government has a duty to go out there and change things. And he used the example of Malawi at the time, Uganda, to say it's, it's all about education, it's about a proactive approach. Now, I don't think we've got time this afternoon to talk about you know, issues in relation to human rights and, and foreign policy and international aid, and that's a very controversial area. But I think we've reached a stage in our emotional and human development um, to recognize that sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender identity is part of being a human being. And that's why even the Joe Jakarta principles even now include straight people. You know, we're not just talking about gay people and lesbians, we're talking about everyone as a human race. So uh, I don't usually quote Eric Pickles, but and I, I don't usually find a lot of his policies very attractive. Um, this whole thing about you know, forcing prayer and all sorts of things like that, or choosing prayer. Um, but I, I, I understand from a good court, uh, source, I think it was on Question Time last week, and we talked about gay marriage. And Eric Pickles, of all the people on the panel, said it's about equality, equality, equality. And that's what we've got to educate those people who persecute other people. It's about equality, equality, equality. Uh, I, as a gay man, is, is not going to find every man in this room or, um, attractive, sexually appealing, as you know, no straight woman or straight man would find somebody of the opposite sex uh, attractive either. It's about ensuring that people don't feel that gay men and lesbians are sexual predators or going to try and corrupt them and corrupt their children or recruit the ch their children. I mean, Harvey Milk once said, we're talking about teachers corrupting children. I would be a nun because he was educated by nuns. So, you know, it's all about education and, and explaining that it's about equality. And I don't think we need to worry about the fact that uh, Uganda may not be too happy with the fact that we give um, sanctuary to gay men and lesbians from Uganda. What we need to make sure is that we don't dilute the argument by saying we don't want to cause offence to other member states because of our views. I mean, it's just, it's just like the um, Archbishop in Scotland talked about gay marriage the other week and said we would be a laughing stock of the world. Why? Why would we, when we look at the world now, look at many states of America, we look at Canada, we look at um, all these countries in, in Europe and South Africa, South Africa, part of Africa, which is our gay marriage, but we're talking about recognizing the human right to equality. In that case, in terms of human rights, is potentially. Oh, yes, I, I mean, I'm a proponent of human rights perspective, but there are a lot of academics, commentators, and judges who aren't happy with human rights perspective into the refugee point. Any final questions? Well, OK, yes. Um, I was just wondering, you spoke a lot about um, tribunals suggesting that LGBT people go home to their own countries and exercise their discretion in terms of their identity. Um, and is this a suggestion that tribunals make to people who are um, applying on the grounds of religious or political persecution? And not um, what well, this course is before the AG Supreme Court decision. Um, and remember that no tribunal would say we expect you to be discreet, because that's been unlawful since the Intercolumbian cases in 1999 and Damien cases. 
you know, if you behave in a certain way, you get refugee status if you're at risk. So it's about you will be voluntarily in this group. And um, there's actually one reported case um, before the HAHD case called SZ Christian Zaran, which actually applied the reasonable tolerable discretion test on a Christian case. So technically it wasn't a, a totally on all gay men and lesbians, but it was really applied universally on gay, gay and lesbian cases. But um, on a technical basis it was also applied in, in a religious case as well, as I said. Good. Well, again, thank you very, very much, Chelvin. And for those of you who want to read a little bit more, as Chelvin mentioned, he's got various papers up online as part of the symposium which took place last week. And I also strongly recommend um, the chapter that he wrote as a UK country expert in the projects on fleeing homophobia, seeking safety in Europe, which he very briefly mentioned as well. So there's a good body of work which you're welcome to refer to. Um, on a very last note, I'd simply say that later this week within the Refugee Law Initiative, we have a meeting at the All-Party Parliamentary Group, to which you're very cordially invited, where we'll be discussing the outcome of the seminars that we've been running jointly with Refugee Council this year, in terms of the implications for the future of refugee integration in the UK. This is being hosted um, in, the, uh, in Port Cullis House by, the, by Parliament, and there'll be various um, peers and MPs there as part of the debate, as well, of course, as the usual suspects amongst the academic and legal community. So you're very welcome to attend. Do just make yourself known to Margarita, so you will need an invitation to get in. But if I can just end on that note and say thank you very much again to Chelvin and agree with you.